Hi friends, welcome to the Eastern Front channel. Today we will talk about the memoirs of Friedrich Paulus Adjutant Wilhelm Adam. He fought with Paulus until he was captured in 1943. Let's try together to understand the reasons for the defeat of Paulus' army in Stalingrad. In the early hours of the morning of the 24th January, the following radio report was sent by Colonel General Paulus to Hitler. The army reports on the basis of reports from corps and personal messages from commanding generals, as far as they are still obtainable, the following situation report. Troops without ammunition and supplies. Elements of the 6th Division still reachable, indications of disintegration on the southern, northern, and western fronts. No unified following of orders possible any longer. The eastern front only slightly changed. 18,000 wounded without the slightest aid of bandages and medicines. 44th, 76th, 100th, 305th, 389th Infantry Divisions destroyed. As a result of strong breaches, the front has been torn apart at many points. Strong points and possibility of cover only available within the city. Further defense futile, collapse imminent. Army requests immediate capitulation in order to save remaining lives. The reply came promptly, it was as unscrupulous as ever. The sense was conveyed in Hitler's radio message. Capitulation out of the question, 6th Army is fulfilling its historical role by fighting to the last round to enable the construction of a new southern front. I told Paulus many times that I regarded this order as criminal and, as a result, not binding on us. Lieutenant General Schmidt, who was hardly weak regarding the Army's fate, demanded further holding on. Paulus remained an obedient soldier and facilitated Hitler's criminal destruction of the 6th Army. Towards 9 a.m. we heard rifle and machine gun fire and the explosions of hand grenades. During the night, the front line had withdrawn to the immediate vicinity of the gully. All the members of the staff stood in front of their dugouts, the drivers ready by their vehicles. Would we come out safely from our bunker village? The 71st Infantry Division had prepared new headquarters for us in the cellars of a former hospital in Stalingrad South. Already Schmidt's cutting voice sounded, Get everything ready for moving headquarters. The remaining files and all disposable personal items were quickly destroyed. Two blankets and a briefcase containing underclothes and toiletries comprised my entire possessions. Apart from what I was wearing, it was high time for us to leave. Already rifle bullets were whistling over the riverine. The windows of the dugout splintered under the pressure of exploding grenades. When we had occupied the headquarters eight days earlier, I had been tasked by the chief of staff with marking out a defensive line on either side of the ravine. But who was going to occupy it? The handful of people on the staff. The enemy had taken further advantage of us. He had used the cover of darkness to push forward to within several hundred meters of the headquarters. Our line of defense was already in his hands. Schmidt gave the order to the vehicles. All took their places in flying haste, the engines howling away. We left the bunker village in a rush, hearing the shouts of the Red Army soldiers from the other end of the gully. A few minutes later and the Army headquarters would already have gone into captivity on the 24th January. Today I can say that it would not have been a bad thing for us and the whole army cutting short the final act and saving many lives, but it gave us a powerful shock at the time. The drivers pressed down their accelerators until we reached the first buildings in Stalingrad, then they had to slow down in order to get through the rubble. Slowly we went round bomb craters, rubble and stones and chunks of concrete, past the remains of walls and chimneys. What shellfire had not destroyed our troops had dismantled to provide building material for positions in dugouts, or, as long as it was combustible, for heating purposes. An officer of the 71st Infantry Division was waiting for us at the Zaritza Bridge. He led us to the designated cellar rooms. There was not much to put up, as we had left most of our equipment behind in the gully. Would this be our last headquarters? Our poor cellar holes made a mockery of the term. The person who seemed the least annoyed was Lieutenant General Schmidt. Soon after our arrival, he ordered me to find out how the surrounding ruins were defended. With this, there also had to be a landing strip for a Fiesler stork. Paulus shook his head at this order. What nonsense. Where can the stork come from? But carry out the instructions if it pleases the chief of staff. Elkluck complained about Schmidt's latest whim. 
but was hardly interested in what we were doing. My impression was that Schmidt had not given up hope of being flown out. Possibly he had established contact with his friend General Hu, whether by a letter that he had given to a pilot on the night of the 23rd, 24th January or by radio. About a hundred meters from our headquarters cellar was a level area of open land that appeared suitable for landing a stork. Lieutenant General Schmidt ordered me that afternoon to make the landing strip identifiable by landing lights, as he expected two of these aircraft that night. They would be towed in by two larger machines as they themselves did not have sufficient fuel to fly so far. Was Schmidt really so naive as to believe that General Paulus would allow him to fly out? Demanding that soldiers and officers should fight to the last man, but wanting to save his own life. What behavior was that for an officer who shared not a little of the blame for the 6th Army being crucified? The night passed, the Chief of Staff waited in vain. His orderly told me that he had not closed his eyes all night long. Aircraft did fly over the considerably shrunken cauldron, but they were supply machines randomly throwing out foodstuffs. The pilots could no longer tell where friend or foe were located, but no Fiesler stork landed. My occupation as adjutant of the 6th Army was at an end. I only had a pencil and writing pad, an official rubber stamp, about a dozen knights' crosses, and the same number of German crosses. Sitting around in the cellar with nothing to do was not for me. I therefore took on the role of a liaison officer and drove first to the 71st Infantry Division, which lay several streets further south, its headquarters fired on by enemy artillery at irregular intervals. On the previous day, Captain von Seidlitz, on attachment as a potential staff officer candidate, had been killed by a direct hit. Just as I entered General von Hartmann's office, several shells exploded again right in front of the building. Among the victims was the Chief of Staff's personal orderly officer, Lieutenant Schatz. He had come in a jeep and had been killed by a shell as he was directing the driver. The General briefed me on a city map about the deployment of the forces still available to him. His voice was calm and relaxed. I intend to go to my infantry in the front line by the morning at the latest. I will seek death among their ranks. Captivity for a general is dishonorable. I am of another opinion, General. Most of our soldiers still living will become prisoners. In our exceptional situation, capitulation and captivity are not dishonorable. We have long had to take this step. I see it as our duty to share the bitterness of captivity with our soldiers. We should say this openly to the troops and not commit suicide in front of them. Permit me to speak openly as I have done so often in these last hours. You too, General, should face the question of responsibility towards our soldiers openly and also towards your wife and your daughter who already grieve over their son and brother. The order of the hour cannot be suicide, but rather the will to survive. It was in vain. I know that you mean well, Adam, but I will go my own way. And that is how he said goodbye to me. Colonel General Paulus was shattered when I reported to him my conversation with Hartman. He immediately telephoned him, but he too was unable to persuade the divisional commander to change his mind. I will be with my soldiers in the last hours and therefore will go into the front line was how he responded to all the reproaches that Paulus made to him. And that was how it remained. My next route took me to Colonel Rosk, who was lying with his staff in the cellars of a department store north of the Zaritza. The upper stories of the building had been destroyed, but there was plenty of room in the underground storerooms so that even the headquarters were well accommodated. Rosk was prepared to let us have part of the cellar for ourselves. In the course of the conversation with Rosk, I discovered that he too was against going into captivity. He was planning a breakout. In the yard of the department store, he showed me a captured Russian truck. It stood there fully tanked up and laden with petrol cans. Rost commented on his plan. I have three surplus Soviet prisoners of war in the headquarters that are assigned to my plan. As soon as the enemy breaks in, we will mix in with their victorious troops and leave the yard and the vehicle in the resulting confusion. We can hardly fail. Everyone will think that we are carrying fuel. As soon as we have the city behind us, we will drive on to the west without stopping until we reach the German southern front. Join us, Adam. We will hide ourselves behind the barrels. For goodness sake, Rosk, have you lost your senses? You cannot believe that I would take your plan seriously. You would never be able to get out of the yard. And what are your soldiers who have believed in you until now and held on with you? Are you going to leave them in the lurch? I cannot believe this of you. Forget these figments of the imagination. 
My impulsive appeal seemed to have made an impression on Rosk. He looked at me in astonishment, then gradually became more thoughtful. Thank you for your words, you were obviously right. A commander really belongs with his men now. I will seriously think over the matter again. We went back into the cellars. I was convinced that Paulus and Schmidt would approve of the change of accommodation, so we went ahead and marked the rooms that our headquarters would occupy. The return journey to headquarters was conducted under enemy artillery and mortar fire. The rubble-strewn streets were almost free of people. Everyone was seeking shelter in the cellars and ruins. Only here and there tottered or crept a few mummified figures, half-starving, frostbitten, or wounded soldiers looking for their unit or a cellar hospital. What had become of our proud Sixth Army? Why did it have to perish so cruelly on the Volga, 2,000 kilometers from home? I was so sunk in my thoughts that I hardly noticed when my vehicle turned off the main road behind the Zaritza Bridge. Suddenly it stopped in front of our headquarters. Paulus and Schmidt agreed to have the army headquarters moved into the ruins of the department store. The timing was left up to Schmidt, depending on how the situation developed. Once I was alone with Paulus, he told me that Seidlitz had sought him out again. Once in Schmidt's presence, he had demanded an army order to capitulate in view of the risk that the commanders might negotiate individually. He was quite right there, Colonel General. Everything has turned out as he forecast in his memorandum of the 25th of November last year. Let us now put an end to this pointless holding on. No one can justify it. But Paulus refused even now, when the cleft between orders and conscience had been irrevocably torn apart. He did not want to follow the voice of reason. You must understand, Adam, that I cannot handle things any other way. I could not understand this any longer, but further words were superfluous. In view of the apparent inability of the army headquarters to operate effectively, individual units decided to handle matters themselves. For instance, a fourth corp order said, with concern for the wounded, the battle can no longer continue in the city center. The present fighting lines are to be held. Where further resistance is senseless, it can be abandoned and this made obvious to the enemy. In practice, this order opened the way to a partial surrender, thus contradicting the interpretation of the army headquarters. Nevertheless, the latter took no action against this. Derisory contempt for the dying army was expressed in a broadcast from the army personnel office, in which it was said that the awarding of the Iron Cross Second Class could be made immediately by company commanders and of the Iron Cross First Class by battalion commanders. What companies, what battalions still had commanders? And to whom could these crosses be awarded on the verge of death? The army staff were aware that Soviet envoys had appeared before the 297th, 371st, and 71st Infantry Divisions in the south of the city requesting an avoidance of further bloodshed. They promised food and medical attention for the wounded of all surrendering units. The commanders received the Russians, contrary to Schmidt's orders, but sent them back without having reached a decision. Paulus and Schmidt took note of these measures without comment. The 297th and 371st Infantry Divisions came under the 4th Corps. I was curious to see if the Corps' orders opened the option of laying down their arms, but for the moment we were unable to find out. The El Klep breakout team had completed their preparations. The first general staff officer asked Paulus and Schmidt to relieve his and his comrades from their posts. Permission was given. Shortly afterwards, the troops set off with a hearty farewell. It would subsequently be run over by the attacking Red Army soldiers in the 297th Infantry Division's area. In place of Elklev, the year of the 71st Infantry Division, Lieutenant Colonel Von Blow, was taken on the staff. In all, we were now down to only 20 of the original 60 officers and soldiers. The little group melded together again. In an outburst of despair, Colonel Elklep's Batman, an old man and head of a family, took his own life. He could not get over his colonel having left him in the lurch. Distracted, he sat silently among his companions. No one took any notice of him when he left the room until the hand grenade exploded outside. We found him lying dead in a pool of blood. Similar reports came from the units with which we still had contact. Suicides increased as the end drew near. In several places an epidemic of suicides threatened to break out, especially among the younger officers and soldiers. 
Late in the evening of the 25th January, we received a message that the 297th Infantry Division had surrendered, together with its commander, Major General Von Drebber. The complete collapse of the army had begun. Early the next morning, I was sitting with Paulus at a small table in front of the cellar window when an orderly entered and handed the commander-in-chief a letter. Sender Major General Von Drebber read the general in surprise. He did not open the letter immediately. Suddenly, a bomb exploded on the street directly opposite our window. The window shattered and shards of glass and bomb splinters swept over our heads. Gunpowder gas blew into the room and the air pressure made the door burst out of its frame. My first thought was for Paulus. Once the smoke had dispersed, I saw that he was bleeding from his head, but it was not serious. I too had had the skin on my head torn in various places. A medical orderly was called in and applied light bandages to both of us. Once more we had been lucky. After this shock, Paulus could at last open the letter. He buried himself in the content. Then he shook his head. That is hardly believable. Drebber describes how he and his soldiers were well received by the Red Army troops, being correctly handled. We were all victims of Goebbels propaganda. Drebber asks me to give up the useless resistance and to surrender with the whole army. Meanwhile, Schmidt had entered the room, his face darkened when he realized what was happening. He raged. Drebber never wrote that willingly. He must have been forced to do it. We are not surrendering. We will move this morning to the department store to better control the divisions. As no stork was now expected to take him away, Schmidt had reverted completely to his former role. On the same day we received the news that General von Hartmann had fallen. Standing upright on the railway embankment, he fired shot after shot from his rifle before collapsing. A bullet to the head killed him instantly. Colonel Rosk was tasked with the command of the 71st Infantry Division. More bad news reached us on the 26th January. General Stemple, commander of the 371st Infantry Division, has committed suicide, reported a staff officer. His son, who was a second lieutenant on his staff, had attended the same class as my son at a Dresden gymnasium. His father had written in his farewell letter to him that he was going to shoot himself as he could not endure this misery. The youngster wanted to make contact with Army Group a towards the Volga with a group of like-minded troops. He did not get far before being captured. Several other 4th Cork Divisional Commanders feel this way. By chance, Schmidt discovered on the 26th January that Seidlitz had given his regimental and battalion commanders the right to surrender at their own discretion. Angrily, he asked Paulus to relieve Seidlitz of his position and put his three divisions, the 100th, 71st, and 295th Infantry Divisions, under Colonel General Heights of the 8th Corps. Unfortunately, the Commander-in-Chief let himself be taken by surprise and gave his consent. I was astounded that Paulus had taken such a heavy measure against a general who, in principle, had judged the situation from the beginning onwards more correctly than the Army High Command. Paulus subsequently saw that he had handled the matter too hastily, but he was not prepared to recall Schmidt to cancel his consent. Paulus by now was in an indescribable condition. As a simple soldier, he was completely helpless to act, unable above all to do something to recover from the unscrupulous Schmidt's act. It seemed to me that he realized he had made a mistake at the decisive moment, but this recognition only weighed him down and paralyzed him further. He was physically and emotionally at the end of his strength. The army staff now consisted only of the commander-in-chief, the chief of staff, the Yaya, the army signals officer, the first adjutant, and some orderly officers. With two cars and a truck, we drove at about noon on the 26th January to our last headquarters. Rifle bullets and machine gun bursts were already striking the streets around the hospital ruins. An officer of the 371st Infantry Division reported that enemy tanks were advancing. The streets were busier than on the previous days when I was on my travels. Wounded and sick were making their way to the local district headquarters MIT. There, according to the army order, they were to assemble and be attended to. But a district headquarters no longer existed there. They had to make room in the hospital. Sick and wounded lay under a tattered roof. Those who could not be accommodated in this building sought shelter in the cellars around until they too were full to bursting. 
As we crawled into the department store, there was not a cellar left in the part of the city still occupied by us that was not completely full. The divisional surgeon of the 71st Infantry Division told Paulus that only a fraction of the wounded and sick were getting medical treatment. In most hospitals, it was pitch dark. At best, the doctors and medical orderlies working in various corners had a few candles or trench lights. Nobody knew how many dozens or hundreds of men lay pressed tightly together on the bare ground. If one did not move for a few hours, the man next to him would call out, There's a dead man here. Perhaps they hardly noticed any more, because the one opposite was also dead. The doctors were almost helpless, having run out of medicines, dressings, and drugs. Often they had lost all of their medical equipment in the retreat, because their vehicles either ran out of fuel or were hit by bombs. In addition to this, the doctors and medical orderlies could hardly stand on their feet from exhaustion, but they did whatever was humanly possible and were supported by the chaplains. There were unimaginable scenes as the command post buildings that had become hospitals were hit by artillery fire. Hundreds were crushed in the crowds, engulfed by the flames and buried under the collapsing rubble. A malicious danger appeared during the last days in the cauldron, typhus. It followed the surviving men of the 6th Army into captivity and swept away tens of thousands of them. At first, hardly any were affected, but here and there a soldier was very tired and breathless, shivering and with pains in the limbs. Then he became delirious and suddenly died. There were also other sicknesses with similar symptoms, but typhus was by far the most serious. The virus, conveyed by lice in the clothing, led to a more than 80% death rate among those affected within one to three weeks. More than 90% of the remaining troops were infected. It was impossible to hunt for the quickly spreading lice in an ice-cold hole in the snow or a dark cellar. Almost everyone who staggered into the prisoner of war camps at the end of January and the beginning of February carried the germs of the deadly epidemic in their bodies. Only a few had been vaccinated, and very few in their half-starved state could withstand the day-long tormenting fever of more than 41 degrees. Despite the selfless commitment of Soviet doctors and nursing sisters, Typha's deaths reaped a frightful harvest in the prisoner of war camps. It continued the cruel game of German militarism with the 6th Army further, leaving only a few thousand alive. The blame was borne by the same forces that had chased the 6th Army to the Volga, keeping them there in inhuman conditions with orders to hold on, until only the wreckage of humanity survived. Dear friends, that's all for today. Please support this video with any comment and don't forget to press like. It was Tim, and see you.